and uh, we're going to let uh, Andres and Lajlo talk about uh, gener their work on the generic resource manager. Okay, so basically uh, the idea was that uh, we're coming from a different angle. Uh, we're not working only on a single application, uh, but we tried to come up uh, with an application layer. So trying to save up time for uh, the applications. Basically what we what we're trying to do is that the idea is to support multiple applications uh, with our layer, and it means if our application becomes, our application layer becomes efficient enough, the applications themselves do not need to be uh, new ever and uh, working on many other optimizations they do, if we can put it to, into our layer. And I mean, just to mention that our, most of our application is currently, they are not uh, DPDK applications, and they don't know anything about DPDK, it's just that uh, we, 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 we want them to configure their uh, application model and, and basically that's how we can gain new more transparent new more awareness and we will describe that. In the last year, uh, in our presentation, we had a couple ideas uh, we did not implement. We just uh, had them in mind and Basically, the generic uh, resource manager uh, was already there, and we're still not yet ready with that, but we have an idea and we have many portions ready. And there are actually a couple others which are uh, already being implemented. So uh, the resource, in, in our terms, uh, we don't really need to explain that this was just an idea if we had much time for the presentation, but we don't. So basically the resource is as we think is that any physical or virtual component of limited availability, that's, that's what's important for us. And if you take a look to the typical resources in the DPDK, by the CPU memory, even the virtual addresses, <coughs> packet pools, whatever, we, we take all of them as resources and we're trying to classify them. So, uh, as we wanted to support multiple applications, uh, we we need to have a better control over uh, all of these resources and we try to hide the, the real environment from the application because we think that if we show them something we think will be much more efficient than in that case the, the application can work uh, much more efficiently. Uh, we also have some sort of uh, migration support but this is not the, the live migration we had uh, the discussion about uh, yesterday. What we're talking about or we are thinking about as uh, migration is that if you have uh, an application in a VM and you want to make it start in a complete other environment, even with different number of cores, different uh, amount of memory and different type of interfaces, basically right now we can do that because what we provide to the applications is our service layer and we have some sort of environment detection there also. I'll talk about it later. And Basically, all of the resources uh, we had there. Oh, we had one more important thing: uh, access control. So we also came up with an idea that we can uh, save the applications from their own faults if uh, some process overrides accidentally the other process's uh, memory area, and also we have access control over uh, interfaces and basically any other resources. And it also means that the uh, application, so, so if in a config an application you have multiple application instances and different types and if one type you don't want to allow to access that particular memory they cannot even attach to that memory partition uh, I mean if you are dealing with memory so we, we can restrict that basically the resource pools are just uh, generic terms on any level of the resources we can have the resource pools uh, the example is that uh, we can have a server and on the server we can run uh, compute nodes and within the compute nodes we can have virtual <laughs> machines and within that we can have DPDK domains or just applications. And even if you want, you can have much more levels uh, even between them. So for instance, uh, we're having, we're having a CPU or a CPU pool. 
And the CPU pool uh, basically contains or uh, might contain uh, lots of CPUs. This is basically what our uh, original or stored resources. And we put uh, this type of uh, resource uh, to a bucket. And on the very same bucket, uh, we can have other types of resources. Here we're mentioning just the memory type and the, and the interface or port or queue or whatever you want to name it. And basically what we do is just, we do subsets of these resources uh, for uh, the lower level. So if you're on the, on, the, on the server level and you go down to the compute node, then we're going uh, uh, these buckets for the compute nodes also. It doesn't need to be all the uh, resource types within the buckets so we can just assign them as we want. And it means that on the lower level, uh, we have, we have uh, just a fewer amount of the original resources, so a couple of CPUs just out of the 36 in the previous one, or eight of the previous 36. And the idea is that we're adding attributes to these, these resources. So in a real-time system, or when you want to work on optimization, there are a couple of interesting things for you regarding CPU. Namely, if it's an HD pair, so if they are siblings or they are on a given socket. We're storing all this information and we're using it when, when classifying and we're assigning. So this is just the same thing what uh, usually the VM manager does now or, or the operating system does. It keeps track of resources. It's just that we want to get uh, detached from that uh, environment because you may, you may be running different types of hypervisors, different types of uh, uh, operating systems, whatever, where the man the, these resources are uh, handled differently. So in this way, depending on the environment where we're running, for example, if you're running on BSD, then you collect the resources in a different way than in a Linux machine. And that's what the EAR different layer, the different EAR uh, does today. We have Linux and BSD layer uh, in EAR. Yeah. And so, so, so the same thing with the hypervisors. If you're running in a VM, like in a Zen virtual machine, where you don't have any NUMA information, because it doesn't yet support exposing NUMA, and in that case, we can just somehow get the information, uh, like by detecting the NUMA topology, or just talking with a hypervisor layer, and then fill up our databases, and then we can attach these attributes to our uh, CPUs or our resources. So uh, these resource pools uh, can be multi-level and they can go down and down and down deeper. And also, uh, regarding the the information we need to or we would like to pass to the guest uh, about the architecture itself, uh, on uh, this resource manager can be a multi-level one. And if you come up with an idea how to communicate between the levels, they can uh, share the appropriate information. So in case of uh, the smaller or more details, more uh, level down resources, we just have fewer CPUs or fewer interfaces or even more. You know, <coughs> and still keep uh, all, all those attributes. Uh, there's an example. This is a really, one, really uh, <coughs> simple one. We actually came up with a, with a pretty uh, complex uh, configuration file. We have lots of options to configure because uh, the idea is still that we would like to, to configure our layer to make the application on top of us uh, work efficiently. And it means that uh, the optimization job, which in other cases are uh, done on the application side, sort of comes to our layer. It means that we need to, a smart resource manager uh, and a smart uh, configuration. So basically, if uh, if we would like to appropriately configure an application, it means that it takes time. So we come up with an idea how to uh, share the resources, how to assign them, but it means you need to do it only, only once, and it's still faster than, than optimizing the whole code of the application. And the other benefit is that with just a single uh, change uh, of, of a line in the configuration, configuration <coughs> line, you can reconfigure basically the, the whole application. So it means that you can uh, configure it to another memory using another packet pool, using another uh, interface. Which is useful when you're running in, I mean, in different environments or different platforms, then you just change the configuration and you can get a lower memory footprint or you can, you can get new awareness or things like that just by changing knobs in a config. So if in, a, in a basic uh, configuration file, uh, we have the CPU aliases, 
let's call uh, this alias as foreground and the CPU must contains only a single CPU there. And we are configuring packet pools also. And it uses the foreground CPU alias and we have the number of packets and the number of uh, cache packets also configured. Uh, the problem comes when we are going to have another uh, CPU using this packet pool or another uh, application instance, another thread, another process, whatever. And of course, if they are uh, on different NUMA sockets, then we're having to pay the penalty. But if we change the configuration just uh, by adding the type as NUMA instead of the default setting, which is the default, we're going to create two uh, separate packet pools, and the given application instances are going to use the one on their own NUMA node. So in this case, actually, I mean, uh, it, it's our responsibility to create these packet pools based on the configuration if it's not clear and. Uh, so, so when our layer is initialized, if, it, if the application asks for uh, allocating these packet pools in advance, then at our service startup, which we were talking about, we touched yesterday that we have a service. So at our service startup, we pass the config, we create these packet pools by calling the same RT create, uh, create pool, packet pool or whatever <laughs> function, and then we create these two pools. In this case, in if it's a NUMA. So you just change the type to NUMA, and then instead of creating one, we just create two. And so if we want to run multiple instances, then uh, they are going to automatically attach to the, to the appropriate packet pool. So the application, when the application comes up, the, the client side, so, it's, so when the application comes up, they just say that I want to attach to my packet pool FG, and all the instances, all the CPUs, all the instances running on those CPUs will be attached to the appropriate packet pool, depending on where they are running. We already know their location where they are running. And if you want the still more details, because uh, we have the luxury of uh, using separate packet pools per, per instances, then we can configure that either just uh, changing the type from uh, NUMA to exclusive, and it means that every single application instance will have its own packet pool. And this is actually, I mean, this is just one example with a packet pool, but you can do this with different, uh, I mean, anything else, like uh, a new MEM domain. If you, cre if you just create uh, an exclusive MEM domain, that's, I will be talking about that later if we have time. <laughs> example, yeah. So, 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 so then, for example, you can do the same with counters. So if you want to, you just create a counter pool, a name, whatever, like similar to this packet pool, you create a counter pool, and then, then you can just by changing the type, you can you can you can switch from uh, switch from using a single count where you need to use atomic uh, counter increments, or if you if it works better for you, then you can just switch to per uh, execution unit, so per instance, per for per instance uh, packet pool, and in that case, or per Cup. CPU, yeah. So in that case, you don't have to use uh, atomic increment. And then on the control uh, part, the control plane, you can also connect to all of these instances. So the only thing the control plane does, it just fetches the number of number of these elements inside the pool, number of counter elements inside the pool, and if you only have a single one, then you will get back a single one, you don't have to aggregate. If you have multiple of these, then you aggregate on the control plane, but you can avoid, this way you can avoid atomic uh, counter increments. So on the fast pass it doesn't hurt to use these counters. Uh, our resource allocator is the very moment is static. So it means that uh, before any application sta starts up, we run our own service. And this service is going to, to classify and, and arrange the resources. But basically what we can do is that when we have uh, lots of different types of resources uh, and resource pools uh, based on some rules we're just assigning. So we're assigning memory or memory areas to CPUs and interfaces together. So when an application instance comes up, a thread or, uh, or a process, and requests uh, its own uh, resources, we're just passing them uh, the appropriate ones. So we're trying to think that uh, these are the most efficient uh, resources they can get. Uh, let's take an example where uh, we have native a native uh, workstation with four sockets and memory interfaces. Uh, we're not mentioning here the storage 
we can add it. So basically, resource manager uh, starts up and auto detect detects uh, basically all the resources we can handle. And auto detect is important because if you don't have the information and we don't have the communication channel between the host and the guest, if you need it, of course, uh, we can also run it native then it means that we have a chance to sort of detect the environment. There are, there are open source uh, applications to detect uh, even the, the cache sizes on different levels of the <coughs> CPU, also uh, verifying the memory, if they, which uh, memory is allocated in which NUMA socket, um, and all these things. Even the, uh, we have uh, a tiny program just to detect the, the HT pairs, HT siblings, we have something, and, so based on that, we can have sort of uh, an appropriate picture about the system. And it means that if you're fulfilling all the re uh, requirements, it means that at that very moment, uh, our application or our, our environment is sort of uh, deeply deep <coughs> confirmed. And actually, we, we have heard a problem that uh, some customers or vendors uh, cannot exactly tell if, if DPDK at all can run on their machines because of different problems with the resources or the resource types or, or even just the CPU type. And actually it can be uh, pretty easy to add it just a step that uh, this uh, environment or this machine is uh, DPDK verified. But it of course requires to set up the appropriate requirements for that. Uh, in our case, resource manager can be anything, even a daemon, a binary, or a library. Uh, we use it as a daemon at the very beginning and also as a library during run runtime. And what we do basically is reading the configuration, which we have seen in the example before, and store it uh, as the free resources. We use the extended attribute tree for that. It works uh, pretty well in, in, uh, for our uh, requirements. What we are not yet ready with is supporting pop-up uh, resources like pop-up CPU, memory, and interfaces. And when we have all the free resources, uh, we can link them together uh, in a pretty efficient way. What I was already telling you that, uh, we can assign to uh, an instance the appropriate and uh, most, the fastest resources. So we can, yeah. <laughs> And also, uh, so we have uh, a notion of mem domain, which means uh, partitioning the memory and configuring it, we also have a packet domain, which means basically uh, uh, defining where the packets will go through the system and how will it go. It's a bit similar, or in many terms similar, to the, the IP pipeline configuration, and if we could mix them up together to, to merge them, then it could give us really a powerful <coughs> configuration too. I just, uh, on a packet domain yesterday, we, we discussed about this uh, <coughs> special type of uh, POMO driver. So that's probably, that's, that's uh, how we can, we can move this implementation or the concept of this packet domain into DPDK. So it's like if we can create a, a new POMO driver type, like which is using RTE, ETH uh, abstraction. So we have a, a new RTE POMO driver type, which is configurable. So, so, for example, you can configure which, which packet pool you want to use on that for that POMO driver. So at the time of initializing the POMO driver, we can create the packet pools already and attach to the ports <coughs> which uh, you configure to attach to. So it's like you can, you can just name the interface, the kernel interface, where, which you want to use for DPDK. So when you initialize the POMO driver, it itself creates the packet pools, it attaches to the the ports and it can also have an, another uh, one uh, way of abstraction like uh, we call it virtual port and virtual queues it's like you create uh, one one port so for example if you from the applications perspective application only see a single port and like a fabric port in, in our case we use that fabric front panel uh, and in that case the the fabric port is just set of queues. So, so like if you're running 16 instances, all these 16 in instances want to attach to the fabric uh, queue, to its own fabric queue. And, and, and in this case, if we can abstract that, this, uh, which, what is, what is behind that uh, fabric port, depending on your config, or depending on your platform or your configuration, the, the same port and the queues, the queues within that port could be mapped either to multiple uh, VF devices or 
or multi queue of Vertio. If you have multi queue support, if you don't have, then you can have uh, you can the queues could be mapped to software queues where you steer the packet or somehow distribute the packets across. So so things like that you can abstract. So but still the application just tells that I want to attach, I want to fetch packets from my fabric queue, and then. Uh, it just it can transparently map to to another. So I mean, we can still use the the existing Pomo drivers. It's just that it's one abstraction. I mean, we still use the 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 RT is dev, but then behind the RT dev, there is another RT is dev which is not. I mean, we can make it performance efficient. So actually, what we are doing is caching on a, uh, the the function pointer on our layer, so we don't have to go through the RTE there, and that also gives us a boost. And then there was the third domain, the DPDK replication domain, uh, we introduced. Basically, this is our solution for <coughs> function chaining, so we let the applications uh, run next to each other, even within a single virtual machine, totally independent DPDK <coughs> applications, because uh, we have the environment that basically our configuration files are in dedicated uh, directories and also the resources. A given uh, DPDK application sees only the resources we pass them, the generic uh, resource manager above the DPDK domain. So it means that even if we have uh, in a virtual machine uh, 10 recipes, we're just passing four of those to one application, so it thinks that he has only four. We, we do separate all the resources. And memory, and so, so the application within this pool can access only the memory which is assigned and which the application has the access to. Here's a clicker. Hmm? Your turn. <laughs> okay, so, so yeah, so, so I mean now, I'm going to talk about the, a bit more uh, details in the, about, the memory, about our memory management, which is again using this uh, type of pool allocation. So most of our resources in this, uh, what we are talking about, is, is using this kind of uh, pool and pool mechanism. Like you always have, you need to have, I mean, a uh, port is just a pool of queues or, or like the same for the memory partition. So we are dealing with memory partitions. So currently, what we have issued is uh, on the DPDK summit uh, in our DPDK summit presentation. So it's like what we have now with DPDK is, uh, is that when you allocate memory, in, so we have two process, uh, or could be two threads as well, is uh, using DPDK memory when you call the RT malloc. It's everything now is in a, a simple single socket. So then that's what you get. You get a fragmented memory. So you then have a separation of the, the memory used by the process one and process two, which, is, uh, which could be a problem if you, for example, if you want to support high availability. In our case, we need to support single process restart. So when a single process restarts, you should be able to clean up all the memory used by that particular instance. And then or, or, or you may need to reclaim the instance when the process comes back again, and we want to control that. So, so yeah. So, I mean, these are the, the memory management goals. What we, what was our goals for the, for our part of application is like we wanted to give them a simple memory management API and transparent NUMA awareness. So the application, most of the application doesn't have to be aware of the NUMA because most of our applications are like. Uh, the same type of instances. Actually, we want them not to be aware. <laughs> yeah, we want them not to be aware. In some cases, you cannot avoid that, but, uh, but most of our applications is like that. Uh, same type of application. Everyone just wants to attach to the fabric, front panel, whatever, uh, their ports, and, and everyone has to has their own, or want to, want, uh, to have a private memory, and and, and, and they are quite well separated. So we slice the traffic across these instances, and these uh, instances are just processing a slice of the traffic, like flopping. You don't, the other instance doesn't have to know anything about the other processes uh, session database. So, so, in, so, 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 yeah, so, so in this case, we can give them transparent human awareness by just by knowing their location. So we know 
where they are pinned to, and we know which NUMA socket they are running. And what we already described as part of the packet domain uh, or the packet pool example, they just attach to their own pool. And so, yeah, so, so, so flexible configuration, reconfiguration, which allows us, allows applications to move in between platforms. So we don't want uh, the application to be recompiled or rebuilt just because of uh, they are running on, running natively or running uh, in a VM, running on top of a Zen or uh, VMware. It's still the same application, still the same library. They just, uh, we just uh, underneath take care of the resources. The application also has some responsibility in some cases because they have to, depending on the environment they are running, so we, they probably need to detect how much memory I have. So they, depending on that, they will apply a smaller footprint of like the supported users will be less in, a, in, in that environment. Test, test, <coughs> testing is a good thing. <laughs> the the, the, that, that's the idea. So everything we do is with the resource manager, resource management and allocating resources is uh, a background task, basically it's slow path, so before starting anything. And on the packet processing pass, on the fast pass or program, uh, we already have, we, we try to give uh, the best available resources. So there is no overhead at all of our resource management. The benefit is that something like if you start up a VM two or three times, we have the very, very same uh, performance because we most likely assign the very same resources. And without having our resource manager, we, we've seen pretty strange behavior that if you restart a VM, then you have different uh, performance numbers from restart to restart. And that's our main goal, that we want deterministic performance even in a virtualized environment. And, and so all the time, it, it, we, don't, we don't want to rely on the, how the Linux underneath allocates memory or whatever uh, other uh, components. So, so that's the... Testing, testing is also a good, a good example because uh, at our company, we have lots of different uh, tests, uh, automated test systems. Some of those are based on VMware, we have virtual box implementation or whatever. And it means that uh, with using, uh, with using uh, our application layer, it means that applications can be tested uh, even in a scaled down manner. It means that no change in the application code required. We just uh, show to the application that, hey, instead of the four CPUs and the four uh, interfaces, you have only two and they run with that one. And even we can mimic uh, CPUs, so even if uh, in, a, in a virtual machine you have a single CPU, so on your notebook you want to test on a CPU system, you can do that. Of course, you shouldn't expect performance, but all the functionality will be there. And by the way, that's a generic rule that on a forwarding, if you, whatever you can do on a control plane, you do it on a control <coughs> plane, so in, in the forwarding path, you don't want to check uh, multiple times Am I running in this environment, and then I'm jumping there, and if so, 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 so you want to want these decisions to be made on the control plane, and then provide the the database already available for the fast pass to make it more efficient to uh, to run, even by swapping pointers, function pointers, whatever. Or you need to scale up. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we need to speed up. So, so yeah, memory partitioning is, is, is the main thing. So this way, we, we touched that also yesterday that, that the uh, application can request for partitions. I uh, have, yeah, actually first I described this, what is a MAM domain? So a MAM domain is, is, is uh, named an index memory partition. Uh, it's a shared memory with defined properties such as the location, so it's like we know the location of which Numan node it is, it was created, size of that partition, if it's physically contiguous or not, uh, and type can be different types of MAN domains. You can have huge page memory, MBAP, MF file, inter-VM shared memory, distributed memory. So actually, from the application perspective, it's just uh, which shell address, so I mean unmapped memory into the virtual address space of the application. So the application doesn't have to know anything about uh, why running if I'm accessing an inter-VM shared memory or distributed memory. So that's our, that's our main goal, that the application, whenever, even on the control, even in their control plane, 
they will never tell or they will never directly attach or want to directly attach to an Intel VM shared memory uh, device. They just say, give me my pre-configured memory for my packet pools or whatever, or, or some private data or whatever, and then we will just give them or map, map it to the address space where they requested. Okay, my domain pool. So this is just like uh, whatever we showed already. So it's like a pool of, pool of memory partitions with a name. So, so in our case, we, we predefined these, uh, these three different types, the default, new one, and exclusive, as we already showed that in a packet pool configuration. So in the default, that's, that's really, that could be even, I mean, the don't care memory, and the NUMA is, is what, in that case, you will create two different types, or well, actually depending on where the application instances are running. So, so it's like within the CPU set, if the application is only using a single NUMA socket, then, then you will only create a single NUMA partition because you, never, you will never use the memory partition on the other socket. Yeah, recently you've seen lots of applications that they run virtualized and their solution for avoiding uh, the QPI hit is just running on a single socket. But this way they can really be NUMA aware because, I mean, we know their location and we know which is the best memory partition for them to run on. So it's like it can be compared to a hard drive, like uh, yeah, partitioning a hard drive and then you have you have you store files and uh, this partition is files within. And usually I mean that's the that's also something which is uh, the so coming up with this configuration, that's a system engineering task. So you need to think on your application model, what is best your, to your application, how can you solve these uh, migrating in between these <laughs> different environments. And, and if, you do, if you do it right, then you really don't uh, care, or you don't have to care about uh, how you uh, move. I mean, when you move your application, you can move into move to different platforms, so run the same application on different platforms. And yeah, we have a simple application API. Probably it's not uh, more interesting, interesting mm -hmm. here because um, this is. We just have, have our own implementation because we want to, to make uh, the non DPDK user applications like easier uh, for the migration. So we came up sort of a simplified API, but uh, I think we will not discuss it right now. Yeah, and uh, actually we touched that briefly. It's, it's, it's the same thing when application just refers to its partition by name and then you will get whatever is configured. And yeah, so, so this is just configuration example where you have, I mean, these are, we are dealing with the CP aliases, but this could be an instance, uh, per instance, so you have an instance group where you group the same type of application instances uh, together, and instances, it can be a thread or a process as well. And, and then you describe the foreground CP alias, which means that you want to filter out every second CPUs in this case, so, so you will be running on these, uh, the hyper threads only if you have that layout. But if you have a different layout, you just change your CPU alias uh, and, and then you, you can get to the same. Uh, so you don't have to, don't care about the underlying layer because in some systems you may have this topology where the hyper threads are on an even odd pair fashion and also the socket is, can vary depending on how you are or how it is exposed to the computation. So, so yeah, so this is just an example. This is the same thing what uh, we already mentioned uh, in a packet uh, domain and a packet pool. Different type of resources. Yes, yeah, so this is our, this is our, our configuration. This is one example. So here it's a default, default type. You, you, you specify where do you want to use this memory and then uh, alloc memzone 2, that means that we will pre-allocate the memzone for that uh, application so they don't have to, they don't care, so they don't have to call memzone alloc, whatever. This can work for DPDK as well, so you can predefine predefine memzone so you don't have to create memzones in your, uh, when you're bringing up your system, you can just attach to it because you know that it's already created. So it's, it can be something which could be moved or implemented inside DPDK. And, and now we're dealing with the size, but the size could also be, uh, I mean, instead of the size, 
you can also mention that uh, here, I mean, instead of mentioning the, the, the huge page sizes, you can, you can mention, I want to pass this memory. So if you don't want to show the application, that application doesn't have to know about the, the, the huge page sizes. So in this way, you can even migrate in between different architectures. Like you just say that for my application shared memory, I will be accessing it on my uh, on a fast pass. So I want it to be the fastest memory. So giving the fastest memory. How do we take the one gig pages? We should take it before the Linux. Uh, yeah, it's the same way today. I mean, what we are doing today is the same way. We're using the DPD the same way. What DPDK does collecting the the huge pages. Actually, we're using the DPDK code for course, that. Yeah. Uh, so. We still use the very same, so the DDK uh, parses and uh, classifies all the huge pages. So what we do is just uh, group them to our needs, and exactly, and we release all the others <coughs> the back to the system. It means that either we can start up our uh, own next DDK domain, which will see the free huge pages and allocate all those. So it allows us to even classify the memory. I mean, we can we can pick the right, the best, best huge pages. So if the application requests for four gigs of physically contiguous memory, then we can prioritize that request. So we can, we can first allocate that four gig to make sure that it's physically contiguous, and then the rest may not care. I mean, the rest may be used only on the slow path, so you don't care. You can even use malloc for those. And that uh, the man domain uh, can allow that as well. So if you configure man domain where you don't care the performance, if you don't have huge pages, and if you don't care performance, and if you don't care physically contiguous, so if you don't have huge pages, it can just uh, we can just use Raven. Yeah, I heard the question is, um, what well, the pages have to be configured when you move the kernel Yeah, yeah. Later, so I can't come along and say, oh, one gig, I'll put two of those on. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That, and that's the yeah, point. It's more of a static binding than dynamic. So you no, you can. Train yeah, I mean, in this case, so we also have a dynamic yeah, API where we can, but we don't want the application to, to deal with these one gig pages. So that the best would be if the application would just, which is we would just define types for the applications, like three types. That's we are also using that. We have three types of memory where the application just says, I want to allocate the fastest memory, or I want to one. So it's like fast, medium, and slow. So in that case, you can prioritize for the fast pass. You will always allocate from the fast pass for the fast memory. And if we have the option, if you have one G huge pages, you can even give them zero TLB missed memory for every instance for this fast memory. No, because we, yeah, 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 right. But, but, the, but, but, but there could be, I mean, if we can build this memory management into DPDK, we can, we can have other ways of allocating memory. So it allows us uh, also to, so like, uh, yesterday I was thinking about the uh, uh, QMU, a driver, a device, a new device. I don't know if it would be possible, but develop a new device or maybe using the IVSH MEM uh, device just to request for memory. So you just boot up the kernel with uh, small memory, with the kernel, whatever is required for the kernel, and then you use the IVSH MEM device or, or another device to request for more memory. And then if you can map that, if you request for physically contiguous memory, and if you want that to be a 1G huge page, you can use uh, the kernel if you have a kernel driver, or, or even with MMAP, I guess we can map today uh, physical memory. We can map, can be mapped as 1G, 2M, or 4K. So you can use the MMAP, I guess it's there in since 3.8 kernel, which is again uh, another, another way of uh, allocating memory. So if you don't want to deal with 1G, 2M huge pages, you just allocate 1G huge pages and then remap them as 2 meg, 2 meg or 4K, <coughs> and you have a different. Recently we were supporting a, a project where uh, a specific uh, NPU uh, behavior was sort of ported to x86, and our layer was uh, their supporter layer. And uh, that uh, specific uh, NPU had different types, physically different types of memory. So, bit similar to, to the Skylix uh, new embedded memory. So uh, even on, on x86, if we had an API to command Skylix how to use uh, that embedded memory, we could really make useful for, uh, for, for forwarding uh, tasks. 
Yeah, or, or if you have a scratch pad in certain uh, natural processing, like in our ASICs, we have a scratch pad, which is unique per execution unit. So in that case, you can just create a man domain where you want that scratch pad, and that's the fastest memory, and that's the fastest available memory, it's like a register. So, so then you can use that memory, and applications can allocate from that memory. So we can just, even with RT malloc, uh, they could allocate from that memory. I'm thinking of running on a different architecture, so building VPDK on an ASIC or different architectures where you have different types of memory. So yeah, so I mean, this is our simplified API. So application will, and I mean, that's the main thing that application, the client doesn't have to know anything about where it is running in most of the cases. So, so it's like they just want to attach to, just refer by name, and then we know which memory is the best for them. So yeah, this is one example, I mean, this is another example of the, of the NUMA type. So the NUMA type, it's like you, so you just, you just change the type to NUMA and you say that I want this to be per NUMA. So, so, so it will allocate 1G per NUMA, 1G partitions or 1G partitions per NUMA. Actually, you can even do something like you, you put 1G on 2 meg, 1G on 1G, and, and then application gets 2 meg. And because this is at the end, it's just one, one man zone. So we are allocating a man zone out of that. And, and yeah, so it's application. When, when, I, when an instance tells that please give me my, my referred by name, my app new machine, then depending on where the instance is running, they just attach to the right new one. And on the control plane, if you, for example, these are, if these are the FIP tables, which you want to maintain, and which you want to replicate, then on a control plane, they can, the control plane can attach to both partitions. It just have to request the number of uh, partitions within that pool. So you can, that's another API give you the number of uh, indexes, number of partitions inside this share, NUMA shell, and then you just have a force cycle and then you attach to both, both partitions and the control plane can replicate. Yeah, okay, so this is, and, and the same thing for exclusive. They just change it to exclusive and attach everything. We'll, everyone will attach to their partition. And actually, this is a model which is useful when you have completely <coughs> separated. So you, every instance is doing the same thing, what I, as I described, like receiving packet, processing packet, and then uh, sending out packets. And there's no communication in between these instances, or that communication is always through the control plane, whatever. In that case, the, these memory partitions can fully be uh, isolated, which gives us memory protection as well, because uh, what we are doing in this case, if, it's a, if these are different processes, then this mem memory partition will not even be mapped into the instance 2's memory space. Uh, so it that's also, also helps when we need to generate core dumps, because basically we save lots of time. And uh, in one of our environments, we basically use a 96G of memory, and uh, in the original versions, when we had to do a core because uh, we didn't have any other opportunity to debug uh, the issue, then ex actually it ate up all our resources, so both the, the hard disks and lots of time. But uh, if we can map only uh, just a few huge pages, the, the given process for the users, then the generation of the core file is much, much more faster. And this is, if you think of this, is, this gives another op option of uh, mapping the partition into the exact same virtual address space. If these are multiple uh, different processes, you can map uh, within this instance, you can map this partition into the same virtual address space. So we have the per instance memory in this case. So, so which could be very useful. You don't need to use the, the thread locals, so you back up the thread locals with with this uh, type of memory, and then you can, if this memory is a zero to abuse memory, it, it's just a con, you can even con have, if it, if it is configured, if the virtual address is configured in your, in the man domain configuration, then you can even hard code that address, and in that case, it's just a constant, and so, so yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, we have an advanced man config API. I mean, this is something which allows the applications to 
to allocate this, not through the configuration, they can just allocate it similar to what we have the DPD command zones, it just uh, allows the application to attach to MAM domains, and uh, which means mapping into the virtual address space, it allows them to map it as read-only, because that gives the other option. <laughs> The, only the control plane part has read-write access to that uh, partition, and the application instances can attach to as read-only. Or, and in case of a FIP table, maybe the FIP table is not even inside that VM, it's an instance VM shared memory managed by another VM. Yeah, okay, so just keep these, I guess, times out. This is the outcome. So yes, this is the outcome at the end. So we have, so if we have these two processes, like uh, instead of this fra fragmented memory, you will get a clean memory partition. So so this in DPDK, if you want to build it into DPDK, so at the moment we are using the DPDK socket. So for for us, when you are running the application in a dual socket system, if you check the DPDK dump config, you will see 16 or more sockets that's how we manage uh, the sockets but but it, it could be done in a way to if we, if we would introduce rt malloc types or because now it's uh, it's on a heap i mean with the latest changes we have a heap so if that heap could be per application instance and maybe it could be configurable via this mat these methods then we can we can get we can achieve this even in a, a dpdk application so and we have per core we can store we can store uh, what is the heap for that application instance, and then in that case, you can you can we can achieve this the same thing with uh, the PDK application. So it's like and and then this is so for us multi-process because of high availability is important because if you kill this process, you can just clean up the same the memory and then you can you're done or or you just if you want the application to reclaim, they can reclaim the same memory. But this gives protection and also TLB, which we showed on the on last year, like TL, it can help TLB because if these are you are only using four one G huge pages, then you will have a zero TLB miss. While in the in the mixed mode, you will be using eight eight uh, pages, and then you you, you have the penalty of TLB, TLB misses, which is a, which could be huge in a in a VM environment. Okay, so future ideas. Yeah, hopefully some of those uh, could be later. Uh, one idea is to support non-DPDK applications uh, without using the API itself. So it's just like an idea, something like uh, using an LD preload to replace some of the portions to make them faster. One of our applications actually is using that to, 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 to overload the malloc function and then malloc will be using our uh, memory allocation. So by using the malloc, whatever, so you can just and you can speed up the application this way without doing any, without changing any code in the application. You give a TR, zero TRB miss for these instances. Yeah, this is what we were talking about. So basically, <laughs> uh, we could define uh, even faster or slower memory types uh, if it helps, or. Uh, basically, we have a sort of a chunk allocator because with uh, supporting a 32-bit uh, project, we also require to have much, much smaller chunks of memory. So we didn't want to, to keep the original 11 or 16 meg heap. We had, had to go down. And right now, we, it is possible with a chunk allocator to allocate uh, 32 bytes of memory of just tiny chunks. And uh, what we did is RT malloc is replaced. I mean, uh, the implementation of RT malloc has just one more branch based based on the size of the application wants to allocate. Uh, we are using the original DPDK malloc, or we go with our. Yeah, application. actually, we hijack the socket uh, inside the RT malloc. We hijack the socket type. We overload the socket type, so that can be used as so. In the lower part, you 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 can refer to the socket, and that's one something which we can how we can build this into DPDK. So like. If you want to allocate memory in the same traditional way, you just use the socket zero, socket one, if you're running on a dual socket system. And otherwise, uh, you can also specify the type. And in that case, you may be using a different memory. And maybe if it's the first time you're accessing that, then it, it is also mapped into the virtual address space. 
and so this way we can improve a lot. Yeah, the deep deep certification we were already talking about, either for for just virtual machines or configurations or hardware. <coughs> uh, we we have heard uh, from lots of people that uh, basically uh, assembling the whole configuration line to start a DVD application uh, is a pain. So probably uh, we could have uh, a GUI just like many VMs or or any other applications have just a front end. Probably it already exists, so somebody might have already implemented. And uh, developing this idea further, uh, we might have a uh, visual resource allocator. So it means that uh, probably just uh, an application could be clicked. So if you, you have um, all the resources like CPUs, interfaces, you're connecting them, pressing enter, and you're done. You basically have uh, the configuration. Either uh, can be sent to our uh, resource manager or can feed the DPDK with the command line if the command line is uh, detailed enough to, to handle all these applications. Or so PK model and SDK where you have these, all these supports. Uh, DPDK OS or a DPDK distro, uh, it looks like a DPDK has its own um, pretty well defined requirements if we stitch, uh, stick on the, the, the performance side and probably just to make other uh, customers or applications come to DPDK, uh, it might be pretty handy if you just release uh, an OS or, or even a VM image where everything is pre-configured, he, he just needs to start it up and he can enjoy. So right now the problem is that we have uh, these different types of uh, hosts and the customers want to use their own host <laughs> environment where uh, we don't have, I mean, it's hard for us to isolate everything, isolate the CPUs, and I think it's a problem for everyone that uh, you need to isolate, you need to guarantee the performance, and, and by the way, that's something, I guess, which we are missing, is the, or I haven't seen that, uh, the dpdk.org, that uh, the requirements which we need to run high performance, I don't know, it may, we may have that somewhere, but this would be good to have a list where you specify that you need, if you want the highest performance, you need to isolate your CPUs, isolate the memories, and, and then if you have that, if you have that list, so that could be part of the DPDK certification also, like you need all these on the host side. I guess that this is something which the, the, the probably OpenAFI or the OpenStack, uh, the isolation components are already working on, but, but it would be good to to have to list all these uh, things which you, which are required to have uh, high performance. There there is um, a patch gone in in just in this release with a, a new part of the documentation about how to get best performance uh, from DK. It's, it's it's a start document really. You know how to isolate cores etc. So yeah, this this could probably be improved. And yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like showing all the options. I mean, how isolate CPUs or what are the ways or CPU sets or whatever which are the Current options today to to fully isolate RC node core bags. What are the required config setup configuration and things like that? To, so just get rid of all the all the context switching overheads and everything on a fast pass core and memory wise also, which I guess we have the requirements, the huge page packing and things like that. Uh, regarding the high availability, uh, the idea is that. If we have an application which runs, for instance, uh, eight, eight uh, processes, we could have a standby one, which means that, uh, as we already said in our case, uh, all the eight uh, processes are pretty much similar. They do the very same. They are just run to completion order. So it means that if one of those crashes, we don't really want to even wait for them to do the core dump, if we enable it and restart it and whatever, but we might have a, a standby instance which means that immediately can take over any of the failed instances uh, job. Of course, it needs uh, some more resources allocated, but uh, it, it means that 999 can be a bit more easier achieved. Yeah, this is what I was already talking about, so I don't know if it's possible or we can improve. We should improve, as we discussed yesterday, if we should improve the IVSH mem memory, but this, is all, this could be one way to to get, so for example, if you have a DPDK device uh, done, um, given us like you or whatever, I don't know how, it, if it would be possible, we can just send, out, send down requests and maybe 
a uh, request for the topology, the real topology, you want to know which CPU is mapped to where, which CPU is on which real socket, the mapping on the other side, if you want to know how memory is mapped. Yes. Um, how can we test these, these ideas because none of the things you presented before are available on DPDK, so how, how can we make the links as a contributor to DPDK? Uh, yeah, that's a <laughs> good question. Uh, our company is not really good at the moment of, uh, of open sourcing things. Uh, they are working on that, so we already have some projects globally in the Ericsson. And uh, actually we got a promise this year, again, that we are going to have we're going to have the possibility of uploading some of these things. It just, most of you must know that uh, in, a, in a bigger company, the things happen much, much slower, and the decision making is unbelievable. And, and there is also that uh, we built, we started this, uh, these things to be built on something on top of DPDK. So our code is not in DPDK style. So if we want to upload, we need to find a way how we can fit these blocks in, into DPDK. That's why we are thinking in like, improving the memory management part by, ex by introducing a new type in RT malloc. But that is, uh, so we can probably keep some part of our code, but we almost have to rewrite that code to be DPDK compliant. But, but all we can see, it, it does work because <laughs> we had all the measurements, so that's why we uh, try to, to explain the idea. And the other problem is, of course, the resources. I mean, we are allocated in multiple projects, so, so we cannot, uh, and, we, we, and, and, and it's hard for a company to, to say that, okay, we want to open source this and then uh, they will allocate our time just to, to deal with uh, open sourcing. So these are the, I mean, there are these problems which we are discussing right now. Can we uh, really <coughs> contribute to uh, DPDK? Actually, yesterday it already popped up that uh, following the DPDK.org mailing is even sort of a full-time job because there are uh, so many mails and ideas and implementation solutions come in that if you really want to to understand what is this whole the given trend about, then you need to do your own homework to dig the code. And there are two, three, four, ten ideas a day or, uh, or things. Oh yeah, a startup. <laughs> so here we have all the guys uh, good at DPD games, so probably it could be good. Not for us, of course we cannot. But the start might be nice. Thank you.